All right. I think we're waiting on a couple more folks. <clears throat> we're going to learn a framework. Thanks, Claire. All right. I hope everybody got a chance to do the quick setup, just creating a, a directory file, getting into it, code. And let's see, let's, let's see what we got. All right, so everybody should be here. I'm gonna go ahead and do this setup. And let's look at the fuck we have. Okay, so, you know, up to this point in this course, we've been building a lot of really robust stuff, right? You look at your unit two and unit three, they're pretty robust apps. Like they're not production level robust apps, right? There's a lot of stuff that has to happen in there got your you need, you need a testing suite um you know all those controllers that you guys write they all have to pass a test uh when you work at your job hopefully and the somebody there's a testing developer who writes tests in order to make sure that every line of code you're writing meets the requirements of the overall application and so that's a whole that's a whole nother 12 weeks of learning if we learn how to write tests uh, there's a lot of different suites there's a lot of different good stuff that comes with that so and in addition to testing, there's a whole bunch of other security concerns and uh, stuff that goes into production level apps that we aren't going to be having the time to or needing to build when we're learning. So we are going to be building um, something new this time, right? So we focused on JavaScript, we focused on React Express node, and we, because that's the market, high amount of jobs exist with those Modern stack, for instance. But one of the many skills is for your, for your, for you to be able to go ahead and learn an entirely new language, a new framework, new technology of some sort. So the experience that you're going to have in this unit, and so far you have been, is your ability to know what you know from the previous units and be able to analogically apply some of that knowledge into and learning a new language, new framework associated with that language. So when we go to learn something new, uh, like Flask, for instance, right? We were, you know, of course, we're going to have to go to the docs and you do that. And by the way, it's, we're all learning Flask as well. Uh, we, we used to teach Django prior to this, and we decided that we're going to change things up a little bit and go with Flask, which is similar to Express. It's a very, very micro web framework. It's a very lightweight framework that allows us to basically make um, any kind of design-based decisions that we need, you know, when you're writing your routes and controllers. Your five steps that we learned in unit two will be applicable here as well. And um, we are going to build a web server with Plus. You can build APIs just like you did with Express. And you can have a really good time because it's quite lightweight. Django, on the other hand, is an extremely powerful framework that allows you to scale apps. So for instance, when Instagram was first built, it was built with Django as the backend, doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. So Flask is light. Now, the good thing about Flask is that there are a ton of extensions and libraries that allow it to become, you know, have the ability to do that heavy lifting. Uh, but the best way to start something like this is pick up the simple, like, hey, let's just figure out what we've got here. So uh, essentially think of this as me summarizing your development experience as you go through the docs and, and checking and tweaking, like, hey, what does this do? How do you run up a server? Uh, what's dynamic routing like? How does the templating in, in, engine work in this particular framework? Uh, how am I able to handle errors? So we're just kind of Take a step by step. So this is a short introduction to Flask. Now, Flask has a built-in web server that we're going to be running. But when Flask out of the box is not ready for production uh, code, 
And that's where we actually have this thing called Gunicorn. And then we use the Whiskey server to set up this entire um, protocol that allows us to make this into a full ready production app. So we're, we're not going to go scratch that surface today. We're going to go and just understand how the heck Flask works. Now, in order to understand any any development server building or usually applications, these big applications that we build, we use a architecture, right? And so what was the architecture that we used for our Express apps? MVC. MVC, MVC architecture, exactly, which is model view and controllers. With Flask um, and generally in Python, we actually, there are, again, it's, it's very similar, it's just it's called differently, but it's called the MVT architecture, right? So M stands for models again. It's gonna be the thing that you talk to the database. Now, with Flask, you can use MongoDB, you can use any database. We're going to be using, as you guys already saw today, a SQL database. And then your view, which is kind of unintuitive, because we've talked about views in terms of what people see. Views are the controllers. So that's the C. And then the template is your actual, what the, the, um, the user will interact with the DOM manipulation. So in Express, we had MVC and we replaced the V with React, which is a JavaScript library. Right, we had two separate repos. We made service calls to our Express API using the controllers and the model to be able to interact back and forth. In Flask or even in Django, you're gonna be using templates and we're gonna learn a templating engine, but you're also gonna know that you can build a Flask API and use it with a React front end. Totally fine. In fact, your React app that you built, that standalone React app that you built the client side front end is totally capable of talking to a Flask backend. As long as we make sure that the service calls are making the proper calls to the views or AKA controllers in the Flask app. So again, this is another very useful architecture. The good thing is when you learn Flask and you understand how servers are built in Python, you can quickly pick up Django probably pick up Ruby on Rails as well, very easily. So this is gonna be a very useful uh, little technology on your belt. Okay, so with these frameworks, we have the ability to define routes. We have the ability to process requests using middleware. And of course we can render these templates on the browser. Uh, and overall, it's nothing new that you've seen. It's just gonna be implemented in a different language and according to the rules of this framework. Uh, so please check out Flask's documentation. They're pretty great. Uh, they are quite um, thorough. They go into all the stuff. The whole idea of Flask is supposed to be simpler. So they, they make sure that you end up getting the most out of this entire documentation and they organized it pretty well. So we're in good hands. Okay, so let's get started. I don't want to take up too much of your time. We'll do a little intro today and tomorrow we'll actually build a full stack Flask app, a simple one that's gonna meet your minimum project requirements as per usual. All right, so what I want you guys to do is let's go to our um, you know, VS Code and let's touch a requirements.txt file. And so this is kind of like your, um, the uh, packet.json file. This is going to be all of the dependencies we're using. Now, the requirements.txt that I have provided over here for you is actually kind of going to take care of all our needs for this unit. Not just for this app, but this is the cool thing about Anaconda, where once we create an, an environment with all these requirements, we don't need to recreate this. You just have to say, hey, open that environment up whenever you're building another Flask app. So for the rest of your Flask experience in your life, you ever need to build a Flask app with SQL backend and a Jenga uh, template, this all works very well. So we don't have to go 
every step download something new. We may have to do some stuff when we think about uh, you know deployment later and a couple other things. But for the most part, this will will it's it's overkill. It's taking care of us. So what we're gonna do is let's go ahead and touch a requirements. <clears throat> .txt. And then in the requirements.txt, let's go ahead and paste the requirements. Cool. Okay. Next, what we want to do is we want to take the environments, uh, the this particular requirements.txt part and make our conda in, in environment in order for us to build applications within that environment. So how we do that is we do conda create dash n, and then we'll call it my flask underscore env. You can call it anything you want, but it's good to have the proper name for it. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter, and it'll take me through a little process here. And I'm going to say yes. And now we've had our environment. And now we're going to activate this environment by using this command right here. So we'll go ahead and activate the environment, which then will result in seeing the parentheses of the name of the environment for us. So we're now currently in that environment. Okay. Next thing we're gonna do is make sure to install these requirements in our environment. And the way we're gonna do that is pip3 install dash r requirements.txt. Perfect. So all of those requirements should download. Um, for me, it's satisfied because I did it, but for you all, if you haven't, it should be downloading right now. Anyone get any errors or any issues doing this? Yes, Boots. Just got a bunch of warnings talking about the, the script flask is installed in the path, which is not a path, not on path. Okay, it's warnings, like, right? Several warnings, yeah. That's fine. That's okay. Okay. Brandon? Uh, I got those warnings as well. And then I got this some error that says launchpad uh, library one point something something requires test resources, which is not installed. Uh, let's see your screen. Can you can you make this a little bit larger? Yeah. Yep. Successfully built fast volume. Okay, that's fine. We're not going to be worrying about that right now. Cool. All right. That's good. Austin. I had the same one as Brandon. Okay. Chris. Yes. Does this have to do with something? I'm still, I'm getting an error cannot install packages due to environment error. Is, do we have to do, do I have to do Python 3 dash M pip install? Yeah, try that command with Python 3. See what that does for you. That doesn't work. We're going to install pip through conda for you and see how that works. Magic Mike. I have, uh, it says ZSH, ZSH command not found pip3. You were able to download everything yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it all worked yesterday. Okay, let's see your screen. And I tried a couple of different things, but I did step by step this one. And then when I did pip install, this happened. And I tried with sudo. I thought maybe yeah. 
it reinstall like we did yesterday and it's the same okay do conda install pip i see i see it uh shazad said he put conda activate my flask and oh he put the wrong environment okay uh, ian is it ian oh. or you said uh well no actually then he did it he, he took care of it again after that he's good oh my yeah, yeah 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 uh i i i actually did yeah i changed it to uh to the right one okay conda yeah. install pip real quick for me this oh dashes mm, yeah that's it yes all right now try the pip3 install you may have to just do pip but let's see what that does this one right yeah there you go hmm cool so do I have to do it every time now? No, no, no. Now you've done, you can't install papers. You're good to go. Okay. Okay. Chris, you How still have work anything? yesterday. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. It's a mystery. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. did that and it's, it's saying permission denied library Python 3.8. Can I see your screen again? What was this command that yielded this error? Did you do conta install pip? And what what does that do? I did. Yeah, it came up with this right here. Any errors? Go ahead and also update that conda for me right there. Grab that line, conda update base defaults. And then do conda install pip after, the, yeah, yes. Now do conda install pip? Yeah. Like so. yeah. And then go ahead and do pip3 install requirements. I think so. Can you also up, uh, upgrade your pip? Pip in this one, pip install upgrade pip. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Try again, pip3 installed requirements. And this next time try if this doesn't work, pip install requirements dash r dash r requirements of these same command as pip3 but without the three dot txt requirements of txt Very nice. Looks okay. like wow. So just use pip from now on since we installed pip. And I think some things again, there's a lot of pathing issues going on, but I think you should be good. Mandy, did you try that too? Yeah, I just want to double check that I'm good. Can I share my screen really quick? Please. Oh, I don't think I can share while Chris is sharing. Oh, yeah, Chris needs to unshare. Chris, you don't need to put anything else anymore. Same error. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you upgraded pip. Did you do conda install pip? 
Um, I think so, yes. But, but it says successfully installed here. Does that mean I'm good or it's still not the... So just do pip require, pip, like instead of pip3 install, do the pip. So go back to that command pip3 install dash on requirements. Um, I'm it's sorry, what do you to pip? Up arrow to, to the point where you use pip3. Yeah, and remove the three. You can't use your mouse. Okay. Cool. Good thing is once you've got this environment ready to go, you guys both should be pretty solid. Okay. Okay. Your font in the terminal is red, so it looks like everything is an error. <laughs> I don't know how you, uh, that's like a lot of mental real estate management. It's good. You say my font makes it look like it's an error? Well, it looks, it's all red, right? It's all oh, pink, yeah. so it looks like everything is an error. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've gotten used to it. But yeah, I know for sure, it's good. Okay, uh, Thomas. I'm not sure if my uh, conda install pip works or my uh, activate rather. Okay, let's see it. Okay. So I did conda activate my flask, but it's not showing up in parentheses. Did you do conda create? I'll do that right now. Oh, what do you mean? It's, it's right there. Like, did you follow those steps? Uh, it, it's not just conda create. There's steps right there on your left. It says conda create dash n my flask the underscore env. Did you follow that? Oh yeah, I followed those. Those are up here. Conda create. Okay, and then did you conda activate my flask env the second command? Yeah, that's what I was trying. I did that uh, a few times to no avail. Did you install Anaconda? Yeah, I thought I got it yesterday or the day before. Go ahead and try doing it. Copy that code over and paste it one more time for me. Uh, copy over, activate my flask. Yeah. There is no conda environment. So okay. try the first command one more time. Then try that command, yeah. And you might need to update your content too at some point. So, got it. Um, yeah. I think at some point in the installation, something may have happened for you, but th that's a little too far back. Um, try the okay. third command, pip3 install requirements. Uh, okay, well, what you need to do is two things. Go ahead and update your conda and then go ahead and update your pip and then see what happens. You may get errors, but we'll have to see. I don't know how, were you able to keep up yesterday? It's not showing in the virtual environment down there. It doesn't say base. So there's probably an install issue with getting problem. conda yep. installed. So. Yeah, I would hold off, Thomas. I we, In order to do that, that would take us on a really far derailment. So let's just... Uh, Chill for a second, we'll get you set up. Cool, sounds good, thank you. Mandy, did you still have a question? Okay, Andrew? Okay, it seems like nothing shows up at all when I press, um, pip and, when I do pip install um, dash r requirements. I wouldn't see it. Yeah. Did you restart your terminal after you did the command before that? and restart VS code? Mm, no. Because if you had to install pip using conda, you have to install re restart your VS code to have access to it, or else it's still going to say not found. I say nothing. I mean, like, there's this, I don't see like those lists of commands. It's just literally just. OK, dude, did you do pip3 install? Like, why? Um, you everybody else mostly needs to do pip3. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does it do? Is he, can you click on your requirements.txt file? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, okay. That's maybe I haven't looked into that yet. It's okay, empty. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I missed something. All right. Probably just look into it. It's in the notion, right? Or... Yeah. Yeah. Just paste it over and then okay. run it. Run a pip three install one more time for me. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. 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 Is this normal to like? Because it seems that every time I'm doing this kind of thing, it's like you have to update conda, install pip, then upgrade pip. I don't think it's normal for every single time. I think we have some padding issues, but I think going forward, you and, and Mandy need to use just pip install requirements.txt instead of pip3 because you're, there's several pips. There's one that's on your machine that comes with Python and then, well, the one not doesn't come with it, but you install it. And then there's another one in Anaconda. So we've got a couple different ways of doing this. Um, so because you have some padding issues going on, we are going to stick for for installation purposes everything to go with through conda for you so some of the stuff that we'll be downloading as a class like pip3 install whatever package you're going to do conda install remember yesterday we did that conda uh something something install anaconda the name of the package so we're just going to do that that will solve the problem if this persists don't worry chris this this is why we have today so we can get through all these problems before tomorrow right and that's the conda install dash c anaconda right. the name of Correct, correct. And I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be sure to be mindful whenever, if we're downloading something, to give you a heads up on that. All right, thank you. For sure. Okay. <clears throat> now, if we go to our app, let's just go ahead and make sure we our ENB shows up. And so we got um, my Flask underscore ENB right here. Make sure you're on that, and let's get started. So let's uh, let's see what we can do over here. So the first things what we do, we'll just build our first server here, and we're going to import Flask. So from Flask, import capital F Flask. Now you may get an underline here. Don't worry about it. it it's these situations occur with VS Code, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to create our app just like we did with Express. So we're going to say app, and we'll say Flask underscore underscore name and remember I talked to you about the the name the dunder name variable yesterday about how that's the name of the main which is the sort of the, the global name of your environment or your your file so that's kind of how we're going to do it and then what we're going to do is we're going to use this app as a decorator function so you remember how we split up things in in Mern stack or in Express where we, we made a separate folder for routes and a separate folder for controllers. Um, and we can still do that here. It's, you will see that too, but it's so simple. We just have to open the app, oops, app.route. We follow the, the, we get the route and then we go ahead and say, this is the index route. And then we go ahead and write our index controller. So we say index, and this is going to take us to some homepage. So we'll return some random stuff here. We'll return an H1 tag. How about that? So we can say party. And then we'll close our H1 tag. Uh, it's got to be in a string. Cool. OK. Now, in order to actually get our index page, we're going to do that one line of code that I that little pattern that I said, which is like how we exported modules and ran a server in Express app. So we're gonna have to say if underscore underscore name double equals to double equals to string underscore underscore main, then we're gonna go ahead and say app dot run. And this is according to Flask stocks. So let's see what this does. And we're just going to run this file. So we're going to say Python 3 app.py. And what that'll do is create this nice little thing over here that says, hey, environment in production, don't use development server, blah, blah, blah. Debug mode is off. And we're running on this. So what I would go is you can command click this or just copy this over. It's not as simple as localhost. We can change that later. And we'll just go to, oh, closure. Okay, um, let's go put this here. And there we get our party over here. Yes, Tim. You are muted. I have an import error. I think I know why, but it says uh, cannot import container from collections at up top. It says um, 
most recent call last trace back file from are you when when you ran the file yes okay let me see it Um, I'm just, how come your uh, underscores look a little, maybe that's your font. Okay. Uh, let me see, where did it start? Right there? Yep. Can you click on the bottom where it says Python 3.10 and, and select the environment we created where it says 3.10? I thought that's what I missed, yeah. It um, also doesn't look like you're, yeah, you are in the environment. Okay. What do restart I your, restart your VS code for me, actually? Okay. Or, or hit that refresh button on the side, top, top, middle, top, right? Middle, top, right. Yep. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Try running this file for me one more time. Container. Uh, make your terminal a little bit larger. Let's see what's going on over here. Can I see your requirements on TXC? It's not empty. Okay, good. Uh, back to the thing. Let's Google this. Mm -hmm. Can I let's take a look at your app.py and see? Can you copy paste over what I have in the notes into yours? Yeah, which part? The that in the notes that that first index function that I have, just copy paste that over. Or did you already have that? I copy pasted before, oh. but. Let's run it one more time. Same error. I'm having the same issue, by the way. Good, good, good. Mandy, you too? Um, I think I'm having, I don't know if I missed something. I've been importing. So module not found. Okay, okay. That's fine. That's fine. I have it. Python is fun for some fun. of us. Let's see. Can you make your air larger? Let's just look at it from the top. Okay. Scroll. Okay, you're good. Interesting. I'm using Python 10, you said. Okay. Well, I'm happy to follow along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll. Uh, this may take a little bit longer to think about what's going on. So that's cool. Just keep pay attention, and then okay. it's a short lesson, and then I'll get in a room with you, and we'll take care of it. Don't worry. Can't wait.
Anthony, I know that you're in that same boat too. Mandy, what's going on? Oh, um, just the module not found error. Are you in the proper, did you click on the environment and everything? Yeah, I think so. I think I did everything. Can you restart your VS code for me? Let's restart it. Yeah, Tim, did you restart your VS code? Like full close and start again also? I'll try. Okay. A lot of times VS code is just overloaded with the stuff. So it's really healthy to turn off all the other VS codes that are open and then start another one. And that helps a lot. Evan? I was having the same problem as Tim, but then I copy and pasted from Notion and it worked, but then I got locked out uh, or I'm getting a 403 uh, on the website. So I'm restarting VS Code now. Okay. Um, okay. Chris? Yeah, I'm still getting a, a module. I'm getting the same thing that Mandy has. Okay, I'm great. Trying to. All right. So, just um, if one of the IAs can just make a message in lecture support, and then all of you who are having problems are put in there, we'll take care of all of you uh, after this lesson. Kareem? I think I missed when you saw uh, Chris's lunch pad lib uh, requires test resource, something like that, which is not installed, getting that error. Okay, I'm gonna have to add you to the same um, group. It's just a couple things in that requirements.txt that will update. Pay attention, you're good, no, nothing to worry about. All right. All errors will be resolved today, we have so much time. Okay. So this is a great opportunity for you not to worry about code and just actually like focus on how Flask works. Okay, so, and besides those module not found errors and a couple other things, everybody else, if you've got an error, please speak up. It doesn't matter if you've got another same error again, I wanna know so we can make sure to address it. All right, so we are able to run this. For most of us, we're running this right now, right? And for those of us, just imagine that that's happening on your machine. All right, so now what we're gonna do is if we wanna create another route, so that's index, if you wanna do something else, um, then we can actually simply, again, run app.route. And here we can say whatever it is that we're trying to do. So if we have an information page or about us page, we can just simply do that. Same thing, name your function. And then we can return something over here. So we can return another H1. And this can say something like the party is tonight. Close that H1. Perfect. So um, if I run this, I'm going to have to restart my server. There's no Notamon yet. There is something equal to it in Flask where we have to run a couple steps, but we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to refresh that, and then we're going to go to our Flask page, and we're going to try and see if the information worked. And there we go. So we should have that. For the, everybody else who's been able to get it working so far, you'll be able to see simple stuff that you've done before. OK. The next thing we're going to get into when we're learning something new again is we want to know, can we do dynamic routing? which is where, remember how when in a particular ID or in a, you know when you create a bunch of stuff, you wanna do a show page or something particular, how do we take care of the dynamic routing? Okay, well, let's go ahead and um, do the dynamic routing. With the dynamic routing, it actually takes in two parameters in your route. It takes in a variable, and then, you know, which is basically similar to something like ID. So when we write our route again, so we do app.route. So first we need to remember, define the route. And here we can say, if I have something like party forward slash, and this is where I can put some kind of variable. So I can say name. And that's gonna be the variable that's gonna be up to whatever the URL I put up there. So I'll say dev party. And here we have to pass in name, like we would pass in ID. And then we can return something here and say, this is a page for, and then we can do a little funny, Python formatting setup over here, dot format. 
And you can do all this stuff here where it's really easy for us to be able to, Python gives us a lot of nice string methods that you can apply at sort of any level. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and restart my server and let's go see how that looks. Doo -doo -doo. Um, and then if I say, I have to go say party and then forward slash, I can say Tim. And then I'll say this page is for Tim, right? All uppercase, because we did the dot upper to it. And you can do pretty much anything you want to that. Cool. So this is the basics of how we think, how we write controllers. I mean, of course, there's so much more that we can do and we will be. But this is sort of the basics of that. Now, there's another feature in Flask that's really useful. So if you're writing, let's write another controller. And let's go ahead and put, um, it, this is gonna test something. So by the way, this is a dynamic graph. I'll just go ahead and make that note here for us. Um, if we wanna, if we create an error for ourselves, which is what we're gonna try and do right now, we're going to be able to debug that in a couple different ways. One, of course, your terminal will burn out, uh, but also we have a debug tool in Flask that comes through, which is really neat. You don't always need to use it and you definitely don't wanna deploy it using that. Uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities where people use debug stuff, but we want to create. So let's create another function called debug test. Um, and well, let's write the route first. So we'll say app.route, and this route will go to, we'll actually create a, like a dynamic one here as well. So we'll say debug, and then forward slash something here. And then we'll say debug underscore test, and this will take the thing. And then I'm gonna try, try to create something silly. So I'm just gonna say something like 100th letter in the thing that we're trying to you know, talk about um, format. And then I'm gonna say thing, and then I'm gonna put an array. And it's, this, is, this is nonsense code, it's not gonna work, but we'll know why, for instance. So Boots. I just want to take a step back for a second. On your dynamic route, when I'm typing in the exact same thing that you have, or at least I think it is, I'm getting a 404 when I do slash party slash boots in my case, but I'm not sure why mine is different than yours. Did you restart your server? I did, but let me just restart it again and I'll get back to you. Okay. Let me know if that worked. Yes, no. Yeah, it worked that time, sorry. I don't know why it didn't work the first time I restarted. You're good, okay, cool. So let's try to run this route. So the forward slash debug, forward slash whatever we want. So, um, which I should probably start, oops, restart my server. And let's go and try to do something here. And then we'll say, party, and if I run this, I'm gonna get an internal server error because my app crashed. Now, I see this index error here, which I, I get to see that in my terminal, which is nice. But I can also try a couple other things here. So this is the nice thing about Python or Flask. We get this option to run inside our runs, uh, app.run statement where we can say debug equals to true. And let's go ahead and restart the server on this one. And now if you notice this, the, when the message on the start of the server, it says debugger is active and here is a pin. Okay, so this pin is a security uh, feature that they have. So let's go and run this one more time and it'll crash my server again, but it'll pop up this nice error handling right here. And in this error handling, it's, you know, it's got a bunch of stuff that's going on. If you look at the bottom, it says index error string index out of range. And so let's see, so we, that only came to us because we put debug equals to true inside our app.run. So why don't we go ahead and if you scroll up here, um, we can grab the, where did that go? That pin. So let's grab this debugger pin. Let's copy this debugger pin. 
And let's take it over here. And if you go over here, if you, if you hover over these, if you go to this last one right here, let's go to this one and click on this little thing that shows up. And over here, you when, I, when you click that, you should get a little message saying, include the pin, please paste the pin in there. And now you have this console here. So in, in here, I can actually type and say, hey, what is the thing? And it says the thing is party. Okay, and I'm having a string index out of range error, right? Because we're trying to put something to do with, you know, a string that's, I just said party, but I'm looking for the hundredth letter and it's, it's like, there's no such thing. So I can actually do a lot of stuff here. I can say type of thing and it'll, it'll, oh, I should, I need to put it in parentheses, type, oops, type and thing. If I do it like that, it'll say, hey, it's, it's a string. Okay, that's cool. So this helps when you are debugging and you're working with wrong data types, you can always come here and check this. Now, of course, you can also look in your terminal, but Flask gives us this nice ability to debug things on the browser. Kind of like console using the, the inspector tool when we work with JavaScript, right? Where sure, you see your errors there, but also you can type stuff there. You can invoke functions in that console to like continue to see what's going on. So this is uh, uh, the equivalent of that in Flask. So that's that's at the in a nutshell. Without connecting to databases or anything, we're not even going to go into creating mock databases. We're actually going to plug right into a SQL database tomorrow. So because you've already seen that when we did the Intro to Express, uh, where we created another array and then we like populated stuff. So we don't need to worry about that. We're just gonna. This is the way your app dot pi will look like now. When we build the app, now we're going to separate a few concerns, of course. We're going to split some controllers up and we're going to have a views folder where all the controllers will go and our app will be pretty skinny. Okay, so now we're able to simply, at this point, we've been passing strings on this page, right? And now how do we pass an actual HTML? So why don't we go ahead and create a templates folder. And this is the niceness of Flask that when you create a directory called templates, it knows to look for that particular file. It knows how to look for it. So let's go ahead and grab the HTML that's here in our Notion. And we can just go ahead and put that in our index.html page. So we got a meta directory called templates. We need to make a file called index.html and then copy this over into that file. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new file here called index.html. And then I'm gonna throw my HTML in there and we got this. Okay, so how do I render this HTML into my view controller? So in order to do that, we need to get one of another package from Flask, so up here at app.py, we need to go up here and we're gonna say Flask and then comma, render template. Cool. So once we get that, this automatically takes care for us to go in here and serve this file for us. So what we're going to do in our index controller, instead of having this string, we're actually going to say return render template. And then in there, we pass the file that we want. Now, of course, when you've got a bunch of different files, maybe, you, you know, different views, things will scaffold up. But right now, this is it. So let's go and check out how to deal with it. Now, before we do that, let's go and comment out our debug testing function over here because it'll keep throwing an error if we hit that route. So let's go start up our Python app and then let's go to our main localhost 5000. There we go. So welcome to the site, yo. We see it here. That's the HTML page that we just serve through using render underscore template method. This is equal to res.render, right? And we did res.redirect, res.render. So we're gonna have something very similar in Flask where we are able to do this. Cool. So now the next thing is we've got to template the stuff, right? We can't just serve static HTML files. As you guys know, we need to be able to be dynamic about this. And that's where the EJS equivalent 
Jenga comes into play. Jenga is nice. EJS had the you know percentage sign with the carrots. We just have two curly brackets and all your variables and all logic of Python can go in there. Now, of course, we can create lots of complex stuff. So all your like if statements, your loops inside that's gonna happen in the HTML all happen inside Jenga. And we actually call these file HTML. We don't have to call them .jenga or .ejs like we did with EJS files. So we can pass strings, list, I mean, pretty much every object. And we're, let's do a couple tests here for that, right? So let's go back to that HTML and let's, let's add a few things here. So let's say we wanna add, um, welcome to the site. And we'll be, instead of yo, we'll say, you know, we'll, we'll say somebody's name, right? Somebody's name is gonna be on the site. Right. I'm doing this a little backwards so that we can, we're starting from the, the template and going to the view. You can go both ways, of course, but next thing I'm going to hear, I'm going to add something called, you know, just letters where we'll go ahead and take whosoever name that is and then make that into an array and display that there. And then, you know, here I'm going to add another object here called person object. All right, so now ideally when you're building this, you think about that in your controller, but when you're designing, that's how you, you look at the, the template first and then you write with controllers. So that's design centric approach. So I've got this now, I'm expecting to see some object here, some, some sort of strain. I'm expecting probably to see some array here whenever I have to write that logic. And then I'm expecting to see an object over here. So let's go to our views or our controller and try and see how we can incorporate that in our index function right here. So let's make some space over here. And inside here, we can define variables. So we can say name equals two, and we can say whoever names we want today, let's use uh, max, mad max. And then we'll say the letters, that, that part where I wanted to sort of make this into an array, it's so easy, we just say list, name, that's beauty of Python. You just make it, which is like the two array function in JavaScript that you use, or something very similar. And then let's put our person object over here. And that's just gonna be a key value pair. And we'll say name of this person is um, Andy 5000. And so that's our person object. So now how do we take our variables that we created into our render template? We pass the same thing we did in Express where we had this callback function and then we then passed this object to serve into the e.ejs file, right? So in here, all we have to do is after we're in here, put a comma and say name equals to name, letters equals to letters, and person equals to person. Now, the cool thing with JavaScript was in that object, you could you just pass name, letters, and person, and it would be able to read it. Um, I have to explore if that's still happening. It's that ability for us to do in Python. Okay, so we passed all those things. So now let's go test and see what that worked like. So if I refresh over here, and it did automatically uh, update my server because I didn't actually have an error. So welcome to the site, Max, that's our name in the double brackets. And then that's max list listed out in an array. And then that is our object. This is how we pass dynamic variables through Jenga templates. Any questions? So this is gonna be the, the, the sort of bare bones way of us learning how to build Flask apps. And now, as you can imagine, like this is, pretty simple, but we're going to have CRUD controllers, right? The create, render, update, delete. Show page, we're going to have to worry about that. We're going to have to think about user authentication. And then we're going to have to plug all of this in to a database. So we're going to have a models file where we create our models. We then use a Postgres SQL to talk to SQL database. And we're going to be able to, what you did today, with the select star from the table, et cetera. We'll, we'll be using an ORM, the mapper language that we'll use that's associated with this to be able to write those queries in our controllers. Something similar to what Mongoose did for us, where it says find all, find by ID and delete, find by ID and update and all those things. 
So that's what we're gonna we're gonna go through all that tomorrow. We're gonna go through some other really fun features that exist with uh, Flask to be able to build stuff. And you're gonna find that it's quite simple to build stuff with Flask. Now, the, the difficulty that you may have this unit is just environmental differences. So some of the errors that people are getting, and that's that's happens when you create environments. That's why we have things like containerizations like Docker and all this stuff so that we avoid these problems. But every developer who's learning a new environment, you're going to have some sort of environmental errors that come. Same thing, you download Ruby, but it was on a different path and it's going to cause all the other problems. So always be open to environmental errors when you're building a brand new environment. Like you don't have those errors with JavaScript and Node anymore, right? But in the beginning, we had some random stuff going on that we just walked through. So something very similar happens when you work with a new environment. When you get a new machine, you're gonna have to download all the environments on there again, then you'll have some other issues going on. So always be open to that. Never let that worry you. It's not gonna last forever. We'll always be able to take care of that. Kareem, you still have a question or hands up from before? Ty. Is there a way to restart this besides doing control C? There is a, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a similar node monish equivalent, but no, I, I would do for now, just control C and start the app again. So we take it step by step. Um, we build something, we kill. If you get an error, it'll crash. If you don't get an error and save the file, it will automatically restart in, there are mild differences here, but Control C is the way to kill it. RS doesn't work the way it used to with node servers. Right, okay, thank you. For sure. When you're learning something new, don't flood yourself with automated uh, uh, tools, right? You know, Nodemon is nice, but you wanna have the ability to kill the server, write a controller, start the server, check it out. When you're learning something new, especially don't, don't go chase automation and like make those things. Just for that first hump, take the, the things as, as they are. Then you'll learn the neat automated stuff, the generators, the all of that good stuff will come. Um, learning something new, this is at least my philosophy. Some people think you should just go straight into automation. And that's again, comes with experience if you want, but when you are fresh to something, stick to the original tools. All right, so that's our intro to Flask lecture today. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be building out a blog, full CRUD, authentication, and we'll be making sure that we get everything uh, in for what you will do for your unit for project. Ilya. Yeah, I have a quick question. In Jinga, can we uh, not only insert like a very variables, but also write functions or something? Everything, you can write all of your, you will be, right? Remember, if you, if you create some stuff, you need to loop over that stuff, right? In order to display it. Yeah, you, you'll be able to do, that's why it's called a templating engine. It allows you to write Python within those brackets. So Python. there's a few things where you have to change in there. Like you, if you're writing a, like tomorrow we'll be writing conditional statements and loops. Um, we just have to let Jenga know that this is the beginning of a loop and this is the end of a loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good question. All right. So welcome to Flask. Um, you have the remaining of the day to get through all that SQL stuff. Now, although after today, you will not be writing SQL queries uh, the way that you are writing in this lab for our course, but it is very good to know how to write SQL queries. And so at least knowing how to do uh, by manually going into the DB and creating a, ta a table and then filling a table up, Having that on your belt is very valuable. It's very lucrative also. So SQL is a good uh, tool to have as we're approaching. The good thing is you know how databases work. Um, and with SQL, there's a couple additional steps that MongoDB took away from you as a convenience. But with SQL, we'll have to think about migrating our database. It gives you a lot more control over the database. All right, that's the end of it. We're going to continue with the lab work. And I know that whoever had any trouble with the lesson errors, um, we're going to figure out all of your problems today. Uh, but feel free to go ahead and take a 10 minute break before we do that. Can I get more break?